now we're going to have a special session with two of the most recognized and respected names in geography. Both of them are AGS counselors, and both of them are considered to be among the foremost experts in geography in the world. To challenge us to think geographically about future geopolitical hotspots, please welcome Dr. Alec Murphy from the University of Oregon and the geographer of the United States, Dr. Lee Schwartz. Alec and Lee. Thank you, John, for that exaggerated introduction. Um, so the first slide I'm putting up is a disclaimer, since my only official responsibility uh, that's congressionally mandated is to uh, issue guidance on all international boundaries for the United States government. And yet here I am, I'm supposed to be talking about the future of the world's political boundaries. I'm probably the last person that should be making some of those uh, provocative thoughts. So that's my only slide I have. Everything I say um, is, is not reflective of any U.S. Uh, policy or positions of the Department of State. So during the uh, coffee break, Alec and I reviewed about 70 index cards. So thank you all for filling them out. Uh, they addressed the five questions that we listed on the sheet of paper that, was, that were distributed to each table. And we came up with a list of 16 themes that give us about 30 seconds for each one, so bear with us. We debated doing this as a, as a point counterpoint, but we didn't have enough time. Plus, we found that we largely were in agreement on many of the issues that you all seem most interested in hearing us discuss, including the fact that we both believe that there will be greater rather than fewer uh, international b political borders uh, 30 years hence, though we reserve the right to be proven wrong. One, one reason we uh, came up with the idea of Geography 2050 is that many of us probably won't be around by then, so we can say whatever is on our mind and <laughs> can't be held accountable. So the two regions that were mentioned most on the cards that you filled out were China and East Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And coincidentally, Alec and I just returned. He just came back from East Asia, and I just came back from Sub-Saharan Africa. So Alec, the first um, issue we have is the future of East Asia. In 30 seconds, please. Right. Yeah, so literally, we have 30 to 35 seconds for each of these themes. So this, all we can do is throw out a few provocative things, and we hope it will just generate conversation. Thank you, Alec. It's my turn. <laughs> so, 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 so China. There's a lot of concern about China these days, and obviously uh, th uh, with, with some good reason. Where might China actually be directly asserting its power? I think it's largely within the areas that were historically, at some point in history, within China's political territorial control. Where it's less likely is outside that area. That doesn't mean China's not going to try to exert influence. But there's a question about China's internal integrity by 20, 2050. Nationalism is an extremely strong force in China. It's coming not just from above, but it's coming from below. People are educated into a system where they think of themselves now in very nationalistic terms, but not everybody in not every place. There are extraordinarily strong pressures at their Chinese periphery in Xinjiang and Tibet. Obviously, we're seeing what's going on in, in, in uh, Hong Kong. I wouldn't bet on China not facing serious problems on these fronts in the decades ahead. Right. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we've been predicting Nigeria's collapse for the past 30 years. I think uh, 30 years from now, uh, it's likely to. Uh, on the other hand, we have um, some states like Rwanda, where I just returned from, since 1994, it's, it's strengthened its international boundaries, and wildlife is even returning there. And in the same year, 1994, Nelson Mandela returned to power in South Africa, and that country seems to be going in the opposite direction. I, I think there are going to be a lot of transboundary agreements. We're already seeing them in terms of conservation. I think that will change a lot of the sovereignty influences. A country like Democratic Republic of Congo, where Kinshasa cannot exert authority toward its boundaries, I think that will lead to transboundary sovereignty that we don't see now. And the AU border program has still not demarcated most of the boundaries of, of Africa. And once they do that, I think uh, there will be adjustments made. So the second question dealt with uh, political, social, or economic forces that might be responsible for changes in boundaries. We want to focus on four things. First one, I'll take the environment. I think the environment actually is getting more attention, but it needs even more. One of the key issues right now is in the maritime arena. So the U UN Convention on Law of the Seas calls for maritime claims to be measured from baselines that lie above the high tide mark. But that's going to change as sea, le sea levels rise. If we want to anticipate where geopolitical hotspots are going to be, that's something we need to be looking at. 
Uh, Lee's going to talk a little bit about the Arctic later, but I want to say something else about environmental stresses. Allison Mounts earlier today talked about how the environment is relevant for thinking about uh, how, what happens at local scales, but we shouldn't just assume that environmental stresses will necessarily lead to conflict. In fact, environmental stresses can often lead to cooperation, and that's been shown by Aaron Wolf and others in, in the water arena, and I think that could happen as well going into the future. Urbanization is the next topic that we were going to address, and I think we're going to see a reordering of space based on agglomerations of urban areas. Uh, there's a, not only have we seen a rise of mega cities, but we've seen a rise of secondary cities around, around the world. I think along with urbanization, what we're not thinking about is deruralization. I think we're going to see some agricultural technologies uh, depopulate, depopulating much of the world, world, which will lead to changes in sovereignty issues related to populations living there. Third issue is mobility. It's kind of easy assumption to say humanity is moving around more. This creates uh, uh, pressures. This is going to change the nature of boundaries. I think that's all true. But we have to remember that despite the superficial appeal of world is flat kind of ideas, by many estimates, something like 40 to 50 percent of the human beings are born in the same place that they die, or at least near, nearby. They never travel more than 100 kilometers or so from where, where they are born. So this is a very much a have and have not issue, and with inequality seemingly growing, it's hard to see that the, that the mobility is going to be a circumstance for all human beings, which again puts pressure on the kinds of things that we heard about from our uh, friend from the census in the last session about uh, what's going to be happening in places like India and Nigeria internally in terms of their territorial integrity. I got stuck with technology. Uh, I'm, Alec and I are probably um, least positioned than most everybody in this room to talk about uh, the technology changes that are going to be affecting us. Because we're but so I, old. <laughs> but I, I think we've got, you know, pervasive monitoring is going to be occurring. Uh, there are positive and negative aspects of that. Uh, it depends on the polity, I believe, or whether there will be glo global governance and a lot of issues like uh, s cyber currency, uh, the, the, uh, the authorities over uh, cyber criminal activities the, that uh, cause threats to sovereignty. Uh, border controls by technological fencing, whether whether that will lead to positive or negative consequences is, is unknown. Uh, and uh, Alec, it's up to you now. Right. So the third question dealt with what evolving arrangements or networks challenge the role of, of the state. And uh, we had, again, four themes that came up here. And the first one I want to address is a sort of new spaces of some kind of actual functional governance that are not captured on a map like this. And actually, Martin Lewis already addressed this point earlier today and actually stole much of the, uh, the thunder I wanted to, to offer on this point, which is actually good because it means people are thinking about these in similar ways. But this is not a map of reality. It's a map of, of a de jure kind of arrangement. And if one really wants to think carefully about the kinds of, of places where you're going to see geopolitical pressures in the years ahead, look at, I would say, two maps. One map would be maps that show territorial control by states that extended beyond where their current boundaries are. I made the reference to China. The second is to look, look at maps where there's a tension between the de facto and the de, de jure arrangements. And those are many. Those will tell you a lot more than simply saying, oh, let's look at where resources are distributed and assume those are the areas where conflict will take place. The next theme we digested from a number of questions as the rise of both corporate and individual sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis the state. What we mean by that is we think there may be a lot of areas where there, there is corporate authority, there may be corporate control of resources, there may be corporate voting rights, uh, there may be, um, there may be uh, corporate polities and international organizations that we don't see today. So we think that the state will lose authority uh, in some cases to corporate influences and in some cases to greater individual authority within the states. So we see those two trends as taking over what currently uh, is dominant, uh, dominated by the state space. So a third theme was the tension between supranationalism on the one hand and secessionism on, on the other hand. And it's easy to see these things in tension, but we actually, they don't necessarily exist in, ten in tension. So a couple of people raised questions about Brexit and the like. And one of the things that I think actually is starting to get attention but should have got attention earlier is what Brexit might mean for the future of Northern Ireland, for the future, future of Scotland and so forth. But the existence of the EU actually could help push a secessionist movement because it provides an alternative focus uh, for, for some of, of these regions. Having said that, I see both of these forces actually continuing to play out. 
supranationalism in a world in which we're seeing, if, if uh, the prognostications are correct, the growing kind of great power relationships. Many, play, many countries can only exert power or it can only hope to exert some power with some kind of supranational uh, uh, t ties. At the same time, secessionism in the face of all the new technologies and ways of interacting that push more identity movements is likely to be something that's going to be continuing as well. Uh, the fourth theme in, in this category, we digest it as polar and outer space. Uh, I think the polar issues are, we have very different issues in the Arctic and the Antarctic. The Antarctic, there could very well be a land grab uh, that will take pla place of the, so the agreement that is in, in place right now with the, with the Antarctic Treaty uh, that just uh, allows for scientific research. In the polar space, I see a lot of future uh, possible uh, arrangements such as a China Nordic alliance, perhaps, that nobody's thinking about right now. Uh, I see the fact of competition over nuclear icebreakers perhaps diminishing once there are enough built uh, to keep the Arctic sea lanes open. And in outer space, I think you have, you have two issues, uh, well, space issues. Uh, we have the issue of drones, which is in outer space, but then they have, we obviously the issue of satellites and the proliferation. Just imagine the number of satellites that will be up there by, uh, by 2050. Great. So the fourth question was, what ethnic group, nation, or people do you think might have the greatest influence on or be influenced by future political boundaries, where and how? Um, not surprisingly, we got a couple of different things here, one of which was the usual Islam. And I would kind of hope that we've reached the point where we're not thinking about Islam in monolithic ways, but there's still a little bit of a tendency to do that. And I think the key thing to understand when we think about Islam is, of course, that there's an enormous uh, set of varieties of splintering. And that splintering, I would see, as not going away, as something we still need to focus attention on. Will there really be a Libya? There's not a Libya now. Will there really be a Libya uh, uh, 30, 30 years from now? I would say the, the area where Islam, its, its homeland, is likely to be one where we'll see a lot of non-state actors playing an increasingly significant role vis-a-vis uh, -vis other parts of the world, and eth ethnic groups like the Kurds. And then two areas that surprisingly weren't mentioned much, and I'm including them because of the fact that they were not mentioned, and I thought they deserved to be mentioned, were Russia and, and India, or the Russia and its periphery and the India, Pakistan, South Asia region. Uh, I view both these areas as potentially very volatile because of uh, religious and ethnic uh, attachments to uh, existing borders. Uh, I, I view both areas as, as, as areas of, of possible change. I think India and, uh, could break up into, into religious organized units or could go the other way and lead to, to greater strife. Uh, I see Russia's internal units as possibly demanding more sovereignty. And I also see a lot of the peripheral areas, the ones that are both currently under Russian uh, control and the ones that uh, may, may be in the future, as an area of, of volatility in the, next, uh, in the next 30 years. So the one-minute sign has already been up for a bit, uh, but the last question was about internal boundaries. And I would just end by, by uh, saying we should be very modest about what we think we can project about the future, a study of projections in 1900 about what was going to happen in the first three decades of the, tw of the 20th century proved to be almost entirely wrong. But with respect to internal boundaries, I think there are two issues. One is the degree to which authority will, within states will be ever greater or lesser with respect to internal boundaries. I would say in a world of greater connectivity, they, states to maintain their te integrity are almost going to have to make some compromises and be willing to yield to some of those forces of, of difference within states if actually they want to keep them under their control. And then the last issue that came up very frequently in the, in the cards that were handed out uh, is the issue of elections. Uh, I see a, a reimagining of citizenship that's going to affect elections. Uh, I, I think, again, I think there will be uh, corporate electoral colleges that could possibly be existing. I think we're going to have some non-territorial elections that will take place with a, with a, with a reimagining of citizenship not based on, on where a person lives, but on some other attachments that person may have. I think we could have both more inclusive elections because of technology and less inclusive elections because of technology. And I think that democratization uh, could very well be on, on the decline in some, in some areas of the world uh, where authoritarianism may prove a more effective organization of space. I believe we hit our 10 minutes. So we asked for three hours to address these questions, but that's what you get. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right.